It's important to remember that ultimately the artist holds responsibility for their own work. The box you send and the way that it is packed sets the tone for your work. The condition report, the information and documentation provided about your work are all a clear indication about your expectation about how you want your work to be handled and how it will be returned to you. Next speaker is Kim Cridler. You heard her on Thursday speaking about her large scale sculptures and she's going to give us a wealth of information based on her experience as an exhibiting artist and she's worked for several shipping companies in the past. What I should have known about shipping large work. Okay, I'm an average shipper, and so you're gonna see that right now. This piece was going to the Penland auction two weeks ago, and because Harriet is really organized and I had to have my PowerPoint to her like before the conference, which is very unusual for me, I was like, okay, I'm gonna take pictures of this while I pack it. It's a steel structure, it has delicate ornament, it's small. So all of my work is fabricated in a way so that I can remove any delicate items, both for fabrication, the potential of repair, and to pack. So those come off, you can see the little tubes that receive those elements. I generally try to write assembly instructions either on loan forms, in this case a donation form for Penland, or I'll attach it to the paperwork that will go into the box. I'm trying to take care of those little parts, partial to Ziploc bags and recyclable containers, because they have some structural density, they're quite light. It's in its reinforced box with foam at the bottom. I, because my work is quite structural, I totally agree with um, Leela about the need for space around the work, although often my pieces are kind of almost suspended in a box and sort of are attached with foam at the foot and at the top of the box, so you see that there. Delicate elements are protected. Um, the loose um, boxes are packed in around the piece that will be fixed in place by another sheet of styrofoam and some packing material. So this is just like average small works that I make and I'm shipping, and I will say I have had two incidents of damage with small works like these, neither of which I packed. So that was my lesson. When you have that wonderful graduate student assistant pack something for you and you take it to your car and, I think I hear something in there. Oh, it's probably fine. She, I'm sure she did a great job. So double check on that. So here we are, ready to go to Penland, instructions on top, address. I like to put the dimensions down. Instructions on how to open the box is pretty nice. So this is fine. This is, I can handle this. It's fine. And when I have a more complex piece, such as this piece, I do make sort of more complex assembly instructions. One thing that I have learned both as a curatorial assistant and as an artist that sometimes gets to see her shows is you can't be too careful explaining to people how you would like to see your work in the gallery. And it's so disappointing to me to come in when you've given very specific examples these three pieces should be on a shelf, they should overlap, they should look like a still life, and then you see them like, like gifts on boxes. <laughs> so it's a great time to create a thorough document talking about each element, where it belongs on the piece, each part is labeled with thorough pictures, and I often will send just a PDF with all of these visual information instructions point by point, as well as um, display information with the work or even preceding the work so that when they know when I follow up with an email saying, this is the FedEx shipment, this is the tracking number, this is when you're going to receive it, this is how much it weighs, that they've already actually have in hand my instructions on how it should be assembled and displayed. Not like they're always gonna follow that information, but you can hope, right? So this is not my problem. This is my problem. Graduate school, 1993, I just love making big stuff. And my lesson, my first lesson was stuff is really expensive. It's expensive to ship, and it's very expensive to store. And one of the professional experiences that I've had that have kind of informed my understanding of this was my first sort of interesting job out of graduate school, because certainly I had a lot of jobs that weren't so interesting, like standing at the Starbucks counter for years, asking every customer where they work. What do you do? Can you get me a job there? And finally I got out. And I got to um, professional packers and forwarders in Los Angeles, and it was really through somebody I met serving coffee, because you make really good customers serving coffee. And uh, it was a great experience. I was an account manager. We got to work with 
some really wonderful clients. We um, served the Los Angeles um, auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's. We worked with Los Angeles art galleries, interior design firms, and we um, housed, remarkably, part of the Eli Broad collection that's part of Sun America, and they're actually building this fabulous museum in Los Angeles now to house his collection. So I would walk into work and see David Sally paintings and sort of extraordinary things. It was a great education. I mean, there are a lot of not great things about having a day job, but if you can get a day job that informs your understanding of your profession in almost any aspect, it's a tremendous asset. You get paid to learn, and I learned a lot. We had a, it was a big old warehouse in Los Angeles, off like La Cienega Boulevard, and we had open art storage. We had a lot of sort of organized collections of things. A lot of clients want to be able to walk in and look at their objects, you know, on the spot. And so we had a lot of open storage for fine art furniture. And then we had more long-term storage in our warehouse. You know, we had these great capabilities, but our clients could afford white glove service all the way down. And when we did work with art shippers, I mean, locally we had a team of men that did everything for hundreds of dollars an hour. When we dealt with art shippers, we worked with fine art shippers that were, you know, the best. And they were expensive. Our crating department, I watched Ellsworth Kelly's get crated and loaded onto flatbed trailers. I mean, and they would have to, we would spend months organizing, like, weight limits for highways so they could pass through areas it was a great experience, and I was lured away into the lavish world of interior design because <laughs> they had all these great materials. Eli and Tom at Hendricks and Allardyce, I became one of their account managers in Los Angeles, and we worked, again, with clients that could afford the very best in shipping and international shipping and fine arts and antiques. So you're thinking, great experience. How did you make that work for you? I had, it didn't. I mean, I had a bigger picture, and I had a bigger understanding about in those sort of those bubble areas of extreme wealth how these things are handled. There were some lessons that I'll take that I took away that I can talk about later, but I was still stuck with, like, well, what about me? I don't have a budget. So another job that influenced how I thought about shipping was the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, where I was an arts administrator. And this was after several years of actually working at the Mesa Contemporary Arts Center here in Mesa, Arizona, where you visited last night. I worked with Patty Haberman, the curator there. I was an assistant curator. And at that level, before we had moved into that lovely new facility you saw last night, um, we worked with a lot of local artists. So there were a lot of people shipping their own work. But then when I went to Kohler, of course, the Arts Center is um, kind of joined, in a way, to Kohler Company which was founded in Sheboygan, Wisconsin in 1873. The John Michael Kohler Art Center is an extraordinary contemporary art um, at venue, and it's actually partially located in John Michael Kohler's home there in Sheboygan. And you know t Kohler today for luxury bath and kitchen products. Here's the factory. I got to know Kohler Company by doing the art residency, and then I later came back to coordinate that program. So this turn-of-the-century factory built in Kohler, the Kohlers of Kohler, which is just really a couple miles outside of Sheboygan, has an extraordinary factory. Um, this is the back of the foundry complex, the pottery building, some shots of what happens in the factory, the foundry, the pottery, and you're thinking, how does this relate to art? Well, there's always been this deep investigation of the Kohlers, of investing in art, of, of thinking about the bold look of Kohler and relating it to the potential of art to serve. They have like this William Morris quote about labor and, and art and, and how, oh, I'm going to forget it, but you know, this really ingrained notion that labor without art is unjust. Uh, this very romantic painting at the turn of the century adorns their clock tower, their office building, and it shows their sort of admiration and, and almost sort of mythical regard for the potential of labor. But this is where the art comes in. Jack Earl, in 1974, was the first artist to participate in what is now known as the John Michael Kohler's Arts Residency Program, and he was in the factory creating works of art using industrial production techniques and working side by side with in industrial workers. But it led to the arts and industry program. He came with Jack Earl, the two first artists, in 1974, and that led to a collaboration between the John Michael Kohler Arts Center and the American Craft Council to host a conference in 1975, which brought together 150 artists and six local industries 
for a real um, platform for exchanging ideas about artistic production and industrial production and how they could work together. That matured, and today the John Michael Kohler Arts Center hosts with Kohler Company a year-round residency program where artists can take advantage of these industrial processes and materials, as we see here with the Renaissance man Michael Sherrill working with both cast iron and vitreous enamel, which is fired onto that iron. These pieces are pretty extraordinary. Or these wonderful works by Anne Agee, who had a dramatic impact on the program in the early 90s. This is her Lake Michigan bathroom. A recent artist, Tamia Tiani, from last year, was working in the pottery. This is her studio space, which is right directed in the factory, on the factory floor. And so arts industry residents are offered transportation, housing, a weekly stipend, safety equipment, free use of studio and materials, unlimited materials, photographic services for their finished work, free packing materials, and best of all, shipping services with common carriers for nine cents a pound. They have a great way of packing work there. This Instapack foam, which sort of perfectly sort of coddles an object within boxes. And there was one time, as a favor, that the, the guys in the pottery helped me pack a six-foot chandelier in this custom box full of Instapack foam. And I was like six months pregnant, and I had the big respirator on, and it was just this insane experience. But because I packed it that way, I could ship it very cheaply. Here's Tamiya's work. After 12 weeks of residency, 40 boxes, 1,800 pounds, she paid $161.40. 10 cents to ship it to Seattle. So another great lesson, not necessarily something we can all take advantage of. So here's some solutions I've come up with. This is the comic part of the thing. Greyhound, have you ever shipped Greyhound? You can. Yeah, no, you haven't. Well, let me tell you more about it. It's really dangerous. <laughs> but there have been times that I have resorted to shipping Greyhound. Look, here's their text. Your one-stop source for shipping oversized, heavyweight, same-day, and overnight freight at incredibly low rates. So as an example, if you saw Lisa Setti Gallery, I just spent $450 with my FedEx three-day three -day super saver shipping account to ship 60 pounds of work. And I could have shipped it with Greyhound for $147. Maximum weight, 100 pounds. They can ship soft pack objects. You don't have to crate it. It doesn't necessarily have to be boxed. The, the cons, insurance, you can't insure it. It's very hard to track, which means you, you could lose it, right? And you have to deliver it to the Greyhound station. I have shipped things this way. It was at a slightly more desperate stage in my life, but I have done this. Um, it's great for really awkward, unusual, heavy things. I've, I hear a lot of people ship wheels and like car hoods with Greyhound. I have shipped with Amtrak. They don't just do coffins. They will take your other things. It's advantages, it's very inexpensive. They can handle up to 500 pounds for palletized items. They can take soft-packed things, unusual shapes. The cons, insurance. There's no insurance. Oh, I'm not saying there's no. It, you cannot insure for the value of your work. You have to take it to the station, and they have limited urban centers that serve. I couldn't actually ship from Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I currently live, on Amtrak. Slightly more amenable services. And this is what I learned from professional packers. Blanket wrap shippers are shippers who specialize in medical instruments, fine furniture, antique items. They'll handle that unusual marble console top that you have. And so it's a less than truckload shipment, which means they will take just one item. Um, they'll come to your house, the pros, they'll come right to your house. They have a lift gate, they have two handlers. They will pad wrap your work put it on the truck, and deliver it to the door of where you want it to go. The cons, it's definitely more expensive. It's not as expensive as a fine art shipper. And my con that I've run into them is when I have tried to exert control and prepare the packing, they will take my packing off, and they will blanket wrap it themselves. And, you know, they think they're doing a good job, but I was, like, horrified to see that an effort that I made to pack this piece that went to New Jersey for the Philadelphia conference arrived there with no packing materials whatsoever. So this was $380 one way to ship it to New Jersey. So that, that show cost me about $760. This piece that you may have seen, another shipping company like that, Navis, uh, about $500 one way. I put it on a pallet that went right from my studio. And you can pick up a pallet really anywhere. 
like behind your hardware store. Creators and Freighters is a place that I was told about from Colette. She works down at Mesa Art Center. She says they're very good for sort of unusual items. I'm definitely going to look into them. So try to think about business. This is hard for me. I'll admit I'm not business-minded. I'm not an entrepreneur. But I have done I have done public commissions where you have to think about how you're going to build it. You have to think about how you're going to get it there. And actually, you have a budget. This is unusual for me to have a budget. So here I am making this piece. And again, somehow I, when I have to ship something big, I'm always six months pregnant. And there it is. And so... I hired a local mover. I called three. I picked the cheapest one. It went 110 miles for $1,000. Very expensive. But I didn't have to do it, and it was heavy. With other public art projects, you're really sort of forced to deal with this right at the beginning. So this halo piece, I actually hired a fabricator in Phoenix that really cut down on shipping from the Midwest. This piece in Oshkosh, before I was even allowed to do the project, I had to think about and write down every possible expense. But the truth is, I don't think like a business person. When I'm in my studio, I'm not thinking about where the work's going. I'm not thinking about how it's going to get there. I'm just thinking about the work. So what else can you do? You can do it yourself with some help. My greatest asset as an artist, um, the Ford Ranger, that was the best thing that I ever invested in after grad school. I got a lot of mileage out of it, and it wasn't until 12 years later with two kids that it seemed like it was no longer a practical family vehicle. So my secret weapon now, the trailer. And I tried to think, works come apart, this big branch piece, 16 feet long, fabricated in sections. I can actually fit it in my Honda. It gets squashed, but it's all in there. This project is just an example for me of how hard it is for me to ask help and how the work I've chosen to do demands that I ask for help. I had to ask the Racing Art Museum to host the show. I had to ask for a grant to build the work for the show. Um, These eight-and-a-half-foot-tall cabinets, I asked a friend to fabricate them. And then I asked another friend to deliver them. I paid him $1,600, but it was two whole days of work, and he had to ask a friend to borrow the flatbed trailer and the truck. And then I asked my sister to come down and help us install it. And it happened because I had to decide it was worth it and that I needed to ask for help. So that's always an option. And you probably saw these already, so I'm going to flip through them. But here's a student who's got that same motivation. He makes big work. It's beautiful work. He manages to figure out a way to do it himself. That is the best loaded trailer I have ever seen. Thank you, Ted and Briny. And there's the work. I was looking at my resume, 22 solo and two-person exhibitions in the last 19 years, 16 involved me getting into a rental truck, and it's so much fun. (laughs) So what I should have known was I was going to do it anyway. So what I try to do now, I try to think ahead. How big is the piece? Can it come apart? Is there a budget? Is there any way to fabricate a budget? If you can't, the best thing for me, two to three months, heads up before I ship something big. I need two to three months to research all the possibilities, to research if I'm going to use a blanket wrap shipper, who has routes going to where I'm going, who is already basically going there anyhow and will take a less than truckload shipment for less. Number three, get lots of bids. And this never occurred to me. Ask for a discount. That's so crazy. But it works. And then last, ask everybody you know for help. I wish you luck. This concludes the presentation by Kim Cridler, titled Chipping Large Sculpture. Kim Cridler also prepared a two-page handout for shipping options, thinking outside the box, less than truckload shipping, and other shipping options mentioned in her lecture. You can find this on the Professional Development Seminar page. Kim also discussed the importance of preparing a condition report and instructions for unpacking, display, installation, and repacking instructions when she exhibited her work. An example condition report can be found in the professional guidelines. Example of instructions for unpacking, display, installation, and repacking can be found in the presentation, Packing One-of-a-Kind Artwork for Shipping, by Harriet Estelle Berman. 
Ask Harriet also provides examples of instructions that Kim Cridler recommends when sending your art or craft to an exhibition. Shipping Large Sculpture was one of seven presentations from the 2012 SNAG Professional Development Seminar. The other presentations include Horror Stories, Packing and Shipping Recommendations by Layla Hamden, Insurance Considerations for Safe Shipping of Jewelry by Tina Pint of Jewelers Mutual. This presentation covers the issues surrounding shipping jewelry from precious metals, loose gemstones, and high-value items. Packing one-of-a-kind artwork for shipping by Harriet Estelle Berman includes a step-by-step -step tutorial for making a custom-made shipping box. There is also a matching four-page PDF handout in the professional guidelines. Shipping comparisons includes shipping costs and insurance with common carriers. There are three different scenarios with three different size boxes and different insurance values with estimates for shipping from Seattle to Pittsburgh. There is also a great handout which offers you the information and cost comparisons. International Shipping Issues by Andy Cooperman discusses the many variables involved in shipping across international borders. The handout offers information about terms used in international shipping situations. Follow along with the PowerPoint, then listen to the question and answer with the audience, which offers additional information about shipping to Canada. If Shipping Goes Wrong, It Really Goes Wrong by Bridget Martin. She shares her experience as a gallery owner with a shipping disaster. Quick thinking, documenting the crate conditions in the truck, insisting on cooperation from the driver, save the day. Learn from her experience so you are prepared. The Professional Development Seminar is sponsored by SNAG, the Society of North American Goldsmiths, and MJSA, Manufacturing Jewelers and Suppliers of America. The Professional Development Seminar takes place each year during the SNAG Conference. All of the PowerPoint presentations and handouts about shipping will be available on the SNAG website on the Professional Development Seminar page. In addition, PowerPoint presentations from the past two years with handouts are also available. All of the Professional Development Seminar information is also available on the website for Harriet Estelle Berman along with the Professional Guidelines. These resources are available so artists and makers can learn to be better advocates for themselves and their arts community. Please feel welcome to share this information with your fellow artists and makers.